How, how has your view of holiness changed from when you first became a Christian to now? Because a lot of new Christians have a lot of fervor and they're kind of white knuckling what they might call holiness. But then uh, when yeah. I meet people further on in the journey, if they're still on the journey, there is this sort of peace to them. And there's, there is a sort of wanting the right thing in the right way as opposed to wanting the right thing in the wrong way. The kind of frantic white yeah. knuckling. What's... How well, that I mean, changed? it goes in stages, you know, so it's a lot like the natural life that Aquinas uses as an analogy that, you know, you're infant, then you're a child, then you're a pre-adolescent, then you're an adolescent, then you're an adult. You know, I, I can say that when I was first converted as a reformed evangelical Calvinist, I was devoted to Luther in high school. I wrote a long paper for my senior, my senior class. Uh, on Luther's rediscovery of the gospel, sola fide, that we're, faith, you know, we're saved by faith alone. And he uses the image that we're a dunghill covered by white snow, which is Christ. And it's an alien righteousness, it's extrinsic, it's not ours, you know. And Calvin, in a certain sense, intensified that view by the first... I'm wondering the, how you would intensify that view. Well, I <laughs> what mean, analogy would you use? Well, you know, the five <laughs> points of Calvin dunghill. are summarized by tulip. Yeah. The first letter, T, stands for total, total depravity. depravity. Yeah. You know, and so... It was this sense that I am I am so depraved that the best God can do is just to cover this dunghill with with snow. Yeah. But then you begin to realize, wait a second, if God is all powerful and if He is sovereign, if He is God the Father Almighty, then however depraved I am, is my power to sin greater than His power to sanctify? That's not even. I mean, just that's bad theology. Yeah. I am powerfully sinful as a teenager, mm -hmm. but at the same time, I know that I belong to Christ. But it was this breakthrough that came to me in my early 20s where you are God, the Father Almighty. You've got to be more powerful to make me holy than I am. I'm still very powerful to separate myself from you through sin. Mm. But let, you know, it's basically, you know, he who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it. And so for me, in the beginning, it was probably more like a sprint you know, I'll race you to the finish line, mm. heaven, you know, and we're not going to have to be holy because we're only going to be always sinful in the end. But what if we are called to holiness? But again, it's not bigger and better. It's smaller and closer, like Our Lady. John the Baptist, yeah. he must increase, I must decrease. And I would say, and this is something that is true in the testimony of the saints, that the closer they get to holiness, the more unholy they feel. Yeah, And so... I would say now, after 50 years of becoming Christian, after 36 years of becoming a Catholic, it is, you know, it's like objects in the mirrors are, are, are further than they look, yeah. you know. I feel as though I need the Holy Spirit. I need the medicine of mercy now more than any point in my life. But then I take great comfort in the fact that that's exactly what St. Augustine yeah. said about himself too. But I think I would get a higher test score in terms of my neediness. But I think he'd give me a run for the money because, you know, what you end up feeling is that, you know, it's a marathon, it's not a sprint. It's God's work, not yours, but it's mm. God working in us, enabling us to do things. But I would say, look, if, if Christ reigns from the wood of the cross, then as we approach the hour of death, or as we suffer, especially, I mean, we can obey the commandments, we can achieve justice, we can strive for holiness, but at the end of the day, we have to recognize that you know, though a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered and thus being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him. Hebrews 5, 7, he was the son of God. Then he becomes the son of man and he learns obedience through suffering. Well, he also learned obedience through attending school and memorizing the alphabet, learning how to read and all of that. But I mean, to me, the end of the day is this idea of saints end up being discovered in heaven as simply those who graduated from the school of suffering. Hmm. You know, and so God doesn't allow us to suffer in spite of his love, but because of it. God sends us suffering because he knows that we need it. We don't want it. You know, I think of, of suffering. You know, Christ wants to heal us of illness, but even more, I think he wants to heal us of our fear of suffering, mm. our dread of illness, mm. and that abhorrence of death yeah. that he only overcame in the garden. You know, loud cries and groans, though a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And so the Gethsemanes of our life sanctify us much more mm. than all of the, the good things that we're doing while we're talking on puns with Aquinas. Mm. Okay. And so the father is like a divine sculptor. 
the chisel is suffering. Mm. We're like the marble that is hard and cold, and then he chisels away through suffering in the hour of death. Nobody is canonizable until they've passed through. And that's why, you know, for the souls that are in hell, they might be smarter, stronger, more mm. virtuous as citizens, but Interesting. the soul in hell is the dropout. He dropped out of the school of suffering. He stopped trusting God. He started resenting God and never stopped. A little bit of contrition at the end would, you know, empty. So that would be a good sign of holiness, wouldn't it? If someone can, how are you suffering? That's how right. well do you suffer? Yeah. And, you know, you look at a saint like Jerome and you realize he didn't suffer very well. Yeah. You know, he, he would cause his opponents to suffer much more <laughs> with his rhetoric, you know. Yes, he would. But this is why holiness is not like one size fits all. Okay. Uh, it is so yeah. important and yet it is so elusive it's not unlike the Holy Spirit, mm. you know, the holy wind. You don't even know where it comes from or where it's going, you know. So trying to be holy doesn't necessarily mean looking like a particular saint, obviously. Yeah, that's right. All right. For you sure. Look at and, Therese of Lisieux, Joan of Arc, who she portrayed. But um, yeah, St. Jerome, Maximilian Kolbe, there's a, there's a great difference in how they look and act. Yeah, and I mean, I, I'm not an expert on holiness, but what I am <laughs> is passionate about becoming holy. Okay. And as a professor, as a writer, as a teacher, I want to understand it better. Yeah. But in the process, as I get older and I get weaker, I realize, you know, that doesn't lessen or diminish my chance of becoming holy. If anything, yeah. it increases it. Excellent, yeah. We have a super chat that's related um, Robert Grant says, so would righteousness be something we practice while holiness is something we receive? Holiness seems to be inherited with the state of grace. Yeah, again, I distinguish to unite. You know, Jesus is a royal high priest, and so he gives to us his own justice. But it just as we distinguish the procession of the Son from the Father and the procession of the Holy Spirit from the Father and the Son, these are distinct and yet inseparable. And I would say we have to keep the commandments which includes the first three. So worship God and no other false gods. Take the name of, don't take his name in vain, which means that we should call upon his name. Hallowed be thy name. The first of the seven petitions were basically saying, we can't make your name any holier than it is, mm -hmm. but because we bear your name, we're going to do everything in the name of Jesus so that your name won't be holier, but we will because we call upon your name. And then the, the third of the Ten Commandments is that we're going to cease from our labors in order to celebrate your work, and especially in the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass, and not just one hour of the Lord's Day, but really setting apart the Lord's Day. So we're keeping the commandments. You know, I just thought of something, and I don't remember whether or not we ever talked about the book that I co-authored with Brendan McGinley, It Is Right and Just, yeah, we did. Why the Future of Civilization upon, Depends Upon True Religion. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I draw from Joseph Pieper and Aquinas that justice has the level of transactional justice, which is commutative, and then distributive justice, which is like social justice. But the highest form of justice, and even Cicero, Seneca saw this, is the virtue of religio. Mm. It's the virtue of virtues, Aquinas says, the highest form of justice. And so what does religion call for? Sacrifice. Where does that start? In the heart, mm. the altar of the heart. And this is the highest form of justice. It is right and just to give him thanks and praise always and everywhere, which implies that it's horribly wrong and profoundly unjust for creatures who have souls that can express gratitude. This is why if somebody's it. upright with the seven commandments, but they have forsaken God, yeah. who is knowable by reason, and they don't call upon his name to make up for what they lack, hmm. and they don't, set up, you know, they don't set aside time to give him thanks and praise always and everywhere, there is a cosmic injustice. It's not a misdemeanor. It's a felony. It's really a profound injustice. And so, you know, when we forget God or when we relegate God to just kind of external actions that don't really begin in the heart mm. of a, of a broken hearted man who's like, you know, I'm a creature, but I'm a sinner. I owe you everything. You owe me nothing. I've given you practically nothing. You give me everything. It's like, what is the only reasonable, logical response to that? Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks and praise yeah. always and everywhere so that everything I do, especially the small things, I mean, taking a shower, brushing my hair, tying my shoes, all of those things, it isn't like I have to deliberately and consciously say, I'm tying this shoe for you, God. But on the other hand, you begin the day, you end the day, and you punctuate the day throughout the day 
with the prayer, with yeah. the rosary, but also, you know, the next hour of work after lunch, when I have a, a difficult time staying alert, I'm going to give it to you. And I think the one thing I, in prayer, the thing I find that the Lord appreciates the most is when I give him the gift of my anxiety, my worry, my weakness, my waywardness. I'm like, you know, I'm going to be on Matt Fred's show. I've got nothing, Lord, you know, nothing. And yet I, I, I sense that he's like, yeah, but they don't want what you have. They want. And you mean that. That's not hyperbole. That's not you trying to sound humble. That's you actually mean that. It's Humility and honesty, I think, are interchangeable terms. I'm being totally honest. Yeah. You know, I, I have a great sense of, I mean, people are like, you get nervous before you give talks. I get nervous before I walk into a class with five students. I am so inadequate. I am so not sufficient for these things. Not just because I'm echoing my patron, St. Paul and two Corinthians. Yeah. We are not capable on our own yeah. of achieving the only thing for which we were made. Yeah. And so to be God intoxicated is to be utterly reasonable, totally logical. You know, it doesn't mean that people don't matter. They matter even more because you don't just love your neighbor as yourself, as Augustine said, you love your neighbor as yourself for the love of God. And so you don't just treat people the way you want them to treat you. You treat people the way that you want them to treat you for the love of God. Mm. And so Jesus you know, knows there's 613 commandments in the law of Moses. The greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God all of your heart, mind, soul, and strength. The second is like it. But it's second, mm -hmm. to love your neighbor as yourself. This is holiness. This is righteousness. Thanks so much for watching. Please like if you liked and if you loved, subscribe.